Hello, I'm Peter Best. Welcome to Meet the Expert, the series of podcasts brought to you by Beringer Ingelheim on swine health management in practice. For this episode of Meet the Expert, we continue our conversation with Dr. Ruth Janssen, who is Field Technical Service Manager on Swine with Beringer Ingelheim in the Netherlands. We're talking about colostrum management for newborn pigs in sow herds. Dr. Janssen, in a previous podcast, we covered the risk that baby pigs in modern large litters may not obtain enough colostrum to give them the right start in life. Uh, for this second part of our conversation, please, I'd like your expert advice on what we might do to improve the quality of colostrum as well as the amount ingested by members of a litter. To recap, you say each pig should ideally be receiving about 250 grams of colostrum. Uh, what are the main barriers in practice that stop individual intakes reaching that level of 250 grams? Hi, Peter. Thanks for uh, for the interview again. Uh, well, when your chickens check for the 250 grams, the biggest limitation, I think it's just it's, it's cookie monster pick swallowing uh, sw swallowing about. 500, 600 uh, grams of colostrum, and leaving the little siblings uh, alone somewhere in the corner, uh, not getting it. That this is by far the, the biggest, the biggest limitation of colostrum intake. Uh, subsequently, when you then talk about the little pigs, it's it's the environment. Uh, if it's too cold, uh, there are too much draft. Uh, they get cool down. They get slow. They don't have the energy to drink anymore. That's the second. And I think on third, sometimes, but it's relative farm specific. Uh, you can also have this, uh, the, the cages of, uh, of, of the sow, which is blocking the other, blocking, blocking the teats for access. So they all want to drink, but then even cookie monster can get the colostrum in, in this way. And uh, that, that could be a specific limitation on, on, on specific farms as well. Ah, uh, yeah. Now, in my head, uh, Dr. Janssen, you know, modern bigger letters, you're getting more variable birth weights. So your cookie monsters and your little ones uh, with, are going to be in the same litter. And the cookie monsters are the first born, I would assume, uh, or at least in the early part of the litter. Uh, so birth order comes into this question. We can't, uh, that I should ask you, how much is birth order dictating colostrum intake? Well, it, it's not that the firstborn pickles are the heaviest ones. Uh, just, just, just determined how they're more or less in in the uh, in the uterus, uh, and, and when the sow is farrowing, they just come one by one. It's it's not that the the, the biggest one com comes first, and uh, even to be honest, I think the biggest one are more or less uh, in between, since there's the most space in the, in the uterus where, where they can get the nutrients to grow this this, this big. Uh, but it's, 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 it's not determined by, by birth order for sure. Uh, but you, there's, they're out there and the biggest one, they don't cool this fast down. They have a lot of energy. They're powered. Uh, so they just, yeah, they're, they're the bully in, in the litter, getting the others aside. And, and just like you, I don't know if you have a big brother that you were bullying in, in, in the past, but, uh, this bullying, it, it needs some supervision to get those larger ones aside and give some extra attention for the little ones, for the little siblings. All right. So clearly we can't do much about birth order, but we can do, uh, we do have options in other ways for colostrum management. I mean, what, what sort of things do you prefer then for colostrum management? What should, what techniques should we be looking at? Well, <clears throat> there, are, there I, I like the split suckling methods, and uh, and it's also when you do split suckling, also important to recognize that that for instance the last born cookie monster piglets will need colostrum uh, for itself as well. Uh, but basically, recognize the pigs at risk, and those are the lightweight piglets, but also the the heavyweight last born piglets should have access as well. And you can easily recognize those pigs. Uh, so you don't sit away to, to, to determine the extra, the exact birth orders. You, you just don't know, but you can see it. You can see a lot, and you can feel. Uh, for instance, when when the milk is into the stomach of the pigs, uh, it it will clot. You you get this mozzarella cheese in in the in the stomach, and you can feel this because the newborn pigs don't have this mozzarella uh, cheese. Also, the, the heavier pigs, um, pigs which also are firstborns, those have a dry umbilical cord, uh, and especially when those 
pigs uh, have a warm skin, a dry umbilical cord, they'll, they'll do well. So they can put at rest for, for about two hours. So set apart four, six pigs, piglets, which are not in the, in, in the risk group. So those are over 1100 grams. Uh, put them apart for two hours with a filled belly, with a dry umbilical cord. And two hours later, you come back and you do your surveillance round on uh, on the farrowing uh, sows again. And you just then, then uh, take the piglets which you locked up for four to six hours, you release them and get some others back into the <clears throat> into this unit where you lock them up. And those are then again, uh, the piglets with a filled belly, which are doing well over these 1100 grams, lock them up for two hours, and then when you come back after two hours again, the, the first batch that the piglets that you, that you locked up, you lock them up again. So it, it does help when you release them that you give them some kind of back spray marks for e easy uh, recognition. So in this way, you give more or less a, a six to, to eight hours head start for the, for the vulnerable piglets. And th this really helps. Now, you said about identifying piglets in that way. Uh, do you start s as soon as farrowing's finished or do you wait a certain time before you start this? Uh, what is your preference on that? Well, you, you can start when uh, more or less 10, 10, 14 piglets have been born and uh, you recognize, and for instance, you know that the sow is also a high prolific sow. You can expect 20 piglets, which are mostly also litters with a lot of uh, smaller piglets with some more, some, some heterogeneous uh, body weight distribution. And you can start then with split suckling about uh, four hours after a uh, birth of the first piglet. Normally, uh, farrowing should be done after four hours, but can take also on circumstances six to eight hours. But especially with those larger litters, and it's already four four hours that they are active, you can lock up this this piglets who have enough colostrum and lock them up for two hours. It's not a problem. I'm with you. Do you think that uh, it's therefore split suckling, or what some people call shift suckling, is uh, something for target litters and target target piglets it's not something to be used as a routine in every case in large batch firing conditions well i would not necessarily mean for for each and every litter uh, but especially when when live birth goes over the 14 and uh, and and the bigger the litter the, the more important it will be uh just reason that uh a sow is about 12 to 14 functional teats. So if you overcome th those amount of teats, uh, then you need split suckling protocols. I'm with you. And if they are first parity, if they're gilts, first litter gilts, are, uh, are those litters by definition more likely to need your help in this way? No, it's 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 for all uh, all the sows. It's gilts. It's also elder sows. Uh, I think with gilts you have normally not, not too much variation in in birth weights, uh, but you still have those vulnerable pigs. I think with elder parity sows there will be a lot of difference in in birth weights, especially when they go over uh, parity six as a seven and, and older. Uh, you will have a lot of heterogeneous body birth weights of of the pigs, and and this will need attention as well. Uh, so basically, every every litters every parity will need it. But it's a bit judging the circumstances they're in. I see. I see. Uh, what extra facilities do we need in the firing barn in order to make split suckling work? Well, it's not too much. You, you need some extra crates to, to place the piglets in, and that, that should be on a warm and uh, warm environment, not in draft. Sometimes you you see in a farm and they put this in those crates, and then the crates is set on in, into the aisle uh, in between the sows, which is ventilated. Uh, so there's this cold cold stream uh, that does not work out. But just use common sense. Uh, lock them up together. Uh, in, in a bit of tiny, tiny crate that are close to each other to keep each other warm and it should be sufficient warmth uh, so they don't cool down in, in the spirit of two two hours, draft free, and that will work. Mm. You, you can even use those, those, those uh, I saw it once on, on, on a farm, those plastic containers they use for uh, disinfectants, etc. Uh, if, if you clean them, of course, uh, but you open them from, from the top and, and you can hang them on uh, on the wall of, of the farrowing crate and you can lock lock easily up four, five, six picks in, the, in those crates. It doesn't cost anything uh, and it's a great, great way to work with. Mm. I've seen some uh, barns where they've got a, a, almost a small crate uh, balanced on the dividing uh, wall between two farrowing crates and uh, put piglets in there. The only question then is the heat, of course. 
uh, if you raise these pigs that you've taken away from the sow and put them up only a little way, you've still got to look at the heat uh, for those. Are they too close to the lamp or what do you do from that point of view? But I, I don't know whether you see that a lot of using this sort of temporary crate balanced on the wall. Yeah, uh, we've seen them balanced on the uh, separation of uh, mm. of the adjacent farrowing pens. Uh, I think it's, it's very farm specific, but just, just use, use your common sense. Uh, the pictures should be warm, and you can use a, a lamp. But also, of course, also check for uh, for fire risks uh, when the lamps are too close or the pigs are burning by the lamp. Uh, just feel with your own hands uh, how the temperature is and, and check for how, how the pigs are doing. Mm. And when the pigs are too cold when, and you get them out and they, they feel cold, and then it's too cold and you should take an action on that one. But it's it's very specific on, on, on how, how yeah. the farm is organized. Right. Uh, it, I have to tell you that not every herd that I visit is, does any split suckling by any means. Uh, I think sometimes they don't like the idea that farrowing attendants must spend more time with every litter born. Uh, is that a, an important consideration? Well, you need some time. That's that's obvious. It's uh, we talk about uh, a bit of extra workload, uh, but it's then ju just I think for the for the farmer as entrepreneur to to judge uh, whether to invest this time, yes or no. And when you just check on on the return on on, on investment, even with with low market prices of pigs, this will pay out. Uh, but yeah, you need to be there. You need to do it, uh, and it will cost you about. Five, five to ten minutes uh, that you will lose on, on, on split suckling, uh, especially when, when you get the experience done, uh, you know how it works, and, and this will pay off but by low mortality, more marketable pigs. Let me pause for a moment to remind everyone that more information on this conversation, like articles, publications and videos, can be found on the website purs.com. Yeah. Now, in the start, you talked about uh, split suckling uh, as being, if I might say, the, the, the starting point, and then uh, you might go to assisted suckling and so on. Uh, can we, uh, is, am I correct, first of all, do, do you consider there are these three levels of colostrum management intervention? Split suckling uh, would be first, and then teat training or, or, that sort of thing for the, the second one. And then I assume there must be a one of collecting colostrum and giving it by a bottle to piglets. But let's, uh, am I right that you see these three levels? Yeah, well, I talk first about spit suckling. I think that that's just the easiest way to do to do the most with, with the amount of time that you need. Uh, so that's more or less the, the bronze level medal. Uh, if you go above that, this will be more individual pig care and attention to, to give them uh, the extra colostrum. The first then is just to help them suckle on, on the teats, to help them add the teats and touch uh, and, and get them in contact. Uh, that's one, but you need, need a vital pig to suckle uh, themselves. And especially for the very vulnerable pigs, which are already chilled and cold, uh, you can only save them with, with bottle feeding or manually milking of sow, but, but get some energy in them. But th this takes quite a amount of time. So that's the gold medal, is it? Yeah. That's, that's the gold medal yeah. for sure. What are the ground rules on helping a baby pig find a teat and suck on it? Uh, which teat and which uh, teat particularly if the colostrum supply is, is more from certain teats? Yeah, well, it starts with teat with colostrum. That's for sure. Um, so, so you check for 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 the other quality, um, and, and there's no no. Yeah, it's also here, and it's just use your brains. Check for for teat with colostrum, which are more or less the front teats. Those are uh, better compared to the hind teats uh, as a rule of thumb. But it should be uh, colostrum in it. But you can check that as well with your hands. Uh, check if it's filled. If you get get some colostrum out of it, and then again, but also important, the nipples should ma match the size of the piglet, especially with uh, when you talk about elder parity sows and with a lot of distribution in, in birth weights. Those elder parity sows, they have, they have large nipples, uh, and if you're a, a tiny, tiny, eeny, meeny mouse piglet with a tiny mouth, you, you and you can even take such a big uh, nipple in your mouth, that will, will not work as well. So that, that that all should be balanced. Does that happen a lot? That you, you know, you if you are assisting suckling, 
that you're putting a pig on to the wrong size of teat? Well, that, that could be possible. I think normal, normal experienced farmers, they will, uh, they will check for this. Uh, but you should check as a vet as well uh, how those practices are being done. And the only way to do it is just go in the farm and on the day of farrowing and work, work there a bit longer than you normally do and, and just, just check for the practices and you will discover a lot. Uh, and then you discuss also with the farmers with those tiny piglets. Yeah, sometimes I, I'm, I'm not a fan of, of cross fostering, uh, sh but the should cross them go into this pig, into the little piglets, and sometimes you can cross foster and, and make more or less a, 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 a uniform litter of, of tiny piglets with a, a gilt or a second parity sow with, with the tinier teats. So they have a chance of, of drinking colostrum. But also when you cross foster, and especially in this colostrum phase, there should be colostrum there. Uh, and that, that's also dependent on, on farm size, on the amount of sows uh, at farrowing, etc. So it's, it's not always easy. That's for sure. Okay, the, the, the other one of oral supplementation, collecting colostrum from sows and giving it in a bottle. I, I mean, we've got to use this, as you say, for the, the young, weak, small piglets and so on. Uh, what are the ground rules there? Do we take it from their own mother or does it matter? I mean, I'm thinking of the immunity status of the sow in that case. Well, the, the, the best, the best colostrum by far is mother's own colostrum. Uh, but if mother does not have any colostrum or there are some specific circumstances that you're not able to, to hand milk, uh, the colostrum from the sows, uh, the second alternative to then is, is, is colostrum from, from another sow. Um, and where to focus the piglets on, those are the predominantly the young, the weak, the small piglets, which are cooled, which don't, sometimes don't even have the reflex for, for swallowing anymore. So, uh, when they come below this 34 degrees, the swallowing reflex will not work as well anymore. Mm. So you're also at the risk of, of overfeeding or, or especially when you're impatient, you, you, you can drown them uh, in this way. So you could do this with stomach feeding with a, with a tube, but it should be done with care. Mm. It should be done with, with patience. Mm. Uh, so, so don't overspeed. Don't Take your time to do this, and, and this can really help. How much in, in milliliters would we be trying to give the pig if we had a target? Uh, good question. Um, I, I think practical experience is uh, when you get in 5 ml, you're doing quite well. Uh, if you're really patient, you can give them about 10 milliliters, but that's about it. Uh, if you provide them more, uh, it should be then you know, higher in the frequency. But I think especially the farms which are very uh, experienced in doing this, they get in five to 10 milliliters, put the pig them back in a warm place so they can re rewarm, can they come up back to, to the normal temperature to get more active and subsequently then they can, can drink colostrum themselves. First time you should help them at the other manually just, just to check are they drinking or maybe bottle feed, feed again. But at the end you, you want to go out of this visual circle of cooling down, getting in some energy and then they should do it themselves uh, half an hour later. If we talk about, shall we say, five to ten milliliters, then I mean, and you're collecting from one sow, how much will you collect, or how long would it take you to collect enough from one sow to be doing this for multiple piglets? Oh, to collect this colostrum, uh, I think it will, will be about five to ten, min ten minutes of hand milking, and it can come easy up to to twenty fifty milliliters in total. Also, the bit on, on the sows and uh, on the size of the teats. Uh, but if, if you have the right front teats, uh, which are productive, uh, it, it's about five minutes to get uh, enough of, of, yeah. of colostrum to provide to any. After, uh, after any collection, Dr. Jansen, should we cool it? Should we warm it? What, you know, what should we do with it? We should give it to the pigs. <laughs> okay. It doesn't need to be conditioned either way for. No, no, just, just uh, milk and feed, uh, just instant, instantaneous use. If you, if you cool it down, it gets cold, uh, and then you won't don't be able uh, to get it into pigs anymore, uh, especially them providing it cold. J don't store it, just get what you need, feed it directly. Oh my. I'm going to go on, please, to what we can do for as managers to uh, improve the quantity and the content of colostrum from sows and gilts. Uh, does feeding come very strongly into this? How we feed the sow and the gill, does it affect colostrum? Yes, especially when you uh, don't feed enough. 
and, and, and that might be a, a problem that you observe in the farms. And some farms they are reluctant to, to, to feeding. Um, they get the sows in the farrowing grades. They come from gestational diets due to mechanics at the, at the farm. They only are, are able to, to feed within the mechanical system then at least to, to feed lactational uh, diets. And when these lactational diets are, are more or less so based on, on milk production and, and that the farmer is anxious that they, uh, they get, you get problems with other pressure or, or edema uh, that, that the sows are not feeling comfortable anymore in the, in the farrowing crates. Well, the first then reflex will be, okay, we give less feed. Uh, but if you give less feed to a sow, especially in the last part of gestation, they need a lot of feed for growth of the piglets, uh, for the pre preparedness of, of colostrum production, etc. So when then you go to an underfeeding uh, below the energy level, uh, this this would imply also less colossal production. Now, level of feeding or what I'm putting in the feed that I give them? Uh, well, basically gestation feed uh, is not suitable for, uh, for producing milk and lactational uh, feeds, are, I think, too concentrated, especially for, for the last days of, uh, uh, of gestation. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm a big fan of, of just transitional diets to overcome the, this, 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 this period of, of the last days of gestation and the first days of lactation. But of course, I do understand that a lot of farmers, they have automated feeding systems. Um, they don't have uh, the technique to, to end feed and a transitional diet and, and, and a lactational diet. It can only be, be one, uh, one feed that they feed the lactational diets with. So that, that, it's not always easy in this way. I do favor a, a system for farrowing houses, especially when they go for, for the future and you, you rebuild your, your barn, that you go to some kind of automated feeding system that you can feed and a transitional diet and a lactational diet in the farrowing crates, just to meet, meet the, the sow's needs. Those herds that do transitional feeds, feed mixtures, do they prepare those from bought-in feeds or what they make themselves, or do they simply... Uh, just buy an off-the-shelf transitional feed mixture? Well, most of the farms, they, uh, at least in Holland where I'm speaking now, uh, I'm located in Holland, most of the farms, they have complete uh, pellet diets, uh, but also a lot of farms we have now, uh, I think what I have to do it by, by heart to do, I think about 30% of the farms with uh, automated liquid, uh, liquid feed. Mm. So, and, and this is uh, more or less uh, a mixture of, of several components at the farm that, uh, with an, an added uh, concentrate to optimize the diets. And, but it's always in supervision of a, of a feed mill advisor to, to help, help them out with the nutritional composition of the feeds. Mm -hmm. But it could make a difference if there was a practical way in your herd or my herd to do transitional feeding. It would be worth something that we should examine. I think that uh, that will be for the future, and especially now with the high prolific sows. Uh, but, but, but we know we, we cannot change a, a farmer's uh, automated feeding system from from the one day into the other, and it's also a big investment. Uh, but but that you can meet the sows' needs during this this more or less transient transient time from from gestation to to lactation with a specific diet. Then that, that's what I'm convinced of. Now colostrum quality in terms of its content of maternal antibodies would depend, I suppose, amongst many things, on what vaccination programs we follow. Is that correct? Uh, you, you can influence the, uh, the the maternal immunity with vaccination. Of course, a, a lot of vaccines are also meant in this way. For, for instance, coli vaccines. Uh, you, you try to protect the piglets by, by vaccinating the sow and, and the colostrum is just the vehicle to get the vaccine into the piglets. And uh, would there be anything which we should be looking at in terms of the timing of the vaccination of the sow before farrowing in, in order to have these maternal antibodies available for transfer? Yeah, it starts with, uh, in, in general, with just a, a booster uh, regime and uh, vaccinating uh, gilts uh, twice uh, with a new, new type of vaccine they, they encounter, of course. And then for, for later life, it, uh, when you optimize for, for farrowing, it should, should be repeated about three, four weeks before, before farrowing to get the vaccine in. So you get this, this boost of IgG at, at the time that the piglets are born and a, and a boost of IgG in colostrum, but also in, in subsequent milk. But this, this in the milk will, of course, be low compared to the colostrum. Yeah. So uh, 
as far as guilt are concerned, uh, uh, not only the feeding and and the vaccination, are there other things that we should be looking at, particularly for, from a colostrum concept? Uh, I'm thinking of acclimatization periods. A longer acclimatization of gilts would be helpful. Or what other things could we consider for our gilts that we're not doing today? Well, I think w w what's important for the gilts. Uh, and it's not not about acclimatization or setter. I think just but it's very farm sp specific and and check with the correct uh, vaccination uh, as advised by the farm by 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 the vet supervising the farm. But when you check, for instance, for for gills, um, the gills there are, are more or less uh, kept uh, free during gestation, and then for the first time in life. Uh, especially then I uh, would take out the insemination barn but, but for the first time they get into the sparing crate uh, there's a unique new environment uh, which is stressful for, for the gills and sometimes you see that the farmers they want to keep the gills all together in one room uh, but this, this will result in just in restlessness. So it's more on the scope of the behavior. Uh, train guilds uh, to go into a farrowing grade, uh, get them acclimatized to humans. So there's a lot of, of normal human interaction with the animals, also during gestation, that they are more or less used to people running around and they're not scared of the people. And they also can learn from elder parity sows. So, so keep them close to elder parity sows in the farrowing crates. So, so they learn. They, they see that the elder sows are also uh, quiet, behaving normal. So they have also the, the, the trust and they're confident and okay, I'm, I'm okay here in the farrowing crate. And not that all guilds are together and a lot of panicking when, when people enter the barn, etc. Uh, still thinking about guilds then. Uh, uh, they're restless, but are they uh, needing special attention in other ways? Are they uh, susceptible to certain things or needing special treatment in certain ways that you would recommend? Yeah, well, uh, since since the guilt is the first time that they start to lactate, but they're also uh, m more vulnerable for for making uh, edema. Uh, so so not they don't have often those, those other pressure issues, but it's more also uh, edema playing a role. And you can recognize this edema fast, uh, just when you're you're walking into the barn and the sows they go stand up, and then you just check for the others. And when there's this whole the other floor, the uh, the other floors, uh, you you can read it in 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 the other itself the, the pattern of, of the floor uh, so that that's edema um, and especially gills can be very vulnerable for for edema and for instance when you talk about uh lactational feeds uh on a liquid feeding farm and you use for instance you use whey uh, cheese whey as a byproduct which is on, on great on 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 uh protein quality but there also is a lot of salts uh, in, in the whey, and especially sometimes if they use whey uh, permeates, which are even more concentrated in, in salt, then you overfeed them in salts, and th this will end in, in, in more edema. And, and that's especially for gills, they're very sensitive for, for the development of, uh, of edema. Mm, thanks. I'm afraid we're going to have to finish our podcast because of time, Dr. Janssen. Thank you for that. But there is... To, according to me, uh, we're doing quite well with colostrum. We can certainly measure what we're doing and, and watch what we're doing. But to me, the take home is the larger litters give us more need to be taking account of colostrum management in our sow herds. And that this will, if litter size continues to grow, this will only become an increasing uh, point for our attention. You would agree with that, I'm sure. I fully agree with you, uh, with you on that. I'm sure. Confident. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Janssen, for your help today. We've been talking to Dr. Rutger Janssen in the Netherlands about colostrum management of baby pigs in sow herds. Uh, this was Meet the Expert. I'm Peter Best. Thanks for listening. Goodbye. Just before you go, we hope you've enjoyed hearing our conversation with the most recent winners of the annual European PERS Research Awards. Bear in mind that next time, one of the winners could be you. Beringer Ingelheim is again providing three awards of 25,000 euros to fund the winning PERS Research Studies in Europe and is particularly interested in practical proposals. The deadline for submissions is the first day of July and more information can be found on the website pers.com. We hope to hear from you.